Please welcome Instagram's most loved and hated man, Dan Bilzerian. The king of Instagram, as his PR firm forces every article to call him. The king alpha male. The king alpha male. Danny B, Dan Bilzerian. I just have bitches around me all the time. I'd be jet skiing. I'd be driving around in Ferraris and private jets. You're living like a, a life that doesn't even seem real. Where did Dan get his money from? Your father was a corporate takeover specialist. He went to jail. They're getting straight up sued by their former president. This just looks fake. Allegedly kicking a woman in the face at a nightclub. Did you do that? Um, well... Allow me to set the scene. The date is February 24th, 2021. A young Instagram influencer is scaling a $63 million Bel Air mansion in hopes of finding its elusive owner, the man with the perfect geometrical beard, Dan Bilzerian. I think we're good. Come on. Dan, are you in there? But what's the deal with this guy? Who, who even is he? On the surface, he looks like a bodybuilder compensating for being 5'9". <laughs> a fusion of Tony Stark and Hugh Hefner. A professional poker player with lavish taste and a massive online following of over 30 million insecure teenage boys. If a lifestyle of touring the world, sleeping with models, shooting machine guns in the desert, parading around exotic animals, sitting down with meatheads, posing with a enormous stacks of cash, partying with major celebrities, and ruining a perfectly good car with a military grade tank seems too good to be true? That's because it is. Dan is a fraud. Dan Bilzerian? He doesn't live here anymore. He was actually exiled from his California dream home just last year, quietly abandoning a key part of his brand that made him the giga alpha chat his fans once considered him to be. Can you write any of this off? Because it's really promoting your brand and your lifestyle. I mean, I have to talk to my accountant about all of it. I don't know. <laughs> but how exactly did we get here? What happened to Dan and the man Bilzerian? Well, that's what I want to find out. But first, we're going to need to go back to where it all began. Daniel Brandon Bulzarian was born on December 7, 1980 in Tampa, Florida. Coming from humble beginnings, his mother was nothing more than a social worker, with his father being but a simple businessman. You know what kind of businessman, you ask? Uh, you know, just the kind that manipulates the stock market for a living. Really successful businessman. Oh. And then the newspaper headlines are... And I think this is like the late 80s, uh, he's indicted for like tax and security fraud. Yeah. So, you know, I'm actually just kidding about that humble beginnings thing. Hard to grow up in a house like this and still pretend you're self-made, but Dan found a way. So how did you make your money then? Playing poker. You made it all playing poker? Yeah. Wow, that is insane. The point is, Paul Bilzerian had become one of the richest corporate raiders in the entire region by the time Dan was just six years old, setting up multiple trust funds for his two sons before being locked away for fraud in the early 90s. He was then ordered to pay $60 million back to the government, and after he paid back $3 million, he was like, uh-oh, I'm out of money. Anyway, on a completely unrelated note, his son Dan Bilzerian mysteriously won $50 million in one year playing poker, which is more than any professional poker players made in their entire lifetime. But trust me, we'll get back to Dan's father in a little bit. For now, I want to focus on the man, the myth, the king of Instagram. And no, I'm not talking about myself, even though Dan and I do have similar followings, with over 10,000 one-night stands under his belt. Wait, 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 did I read that right? 10,000? 10, 10,000 one-night stands in one house? 17 chicks. <laughs> and I, me I remember I had sex nine times in one day. I was like so proud of myself. Well, I mean, it's good Dan would never lie to us, though. I mean, I guess we're just gonna have to take his word for it. He objectifies women on a mainstream platform, normalizing women as background rather than as actual human beings. In other words, you make women, according to them, props. Yeah, I mean, I guess I said the same thing about Hugh Hefner, right? <laughs> Is that supposed to be a, a good thing? I mean, they said the same thing about Hugh Hefner. <laughs> I yeah, they did. Um, I don't know. I uh, I just take pictures and the women are there, so I don't know. I mean, it's it's all up to interpretation. I mean, people can. What is your it. interpretation? 
uh, that, you know, I'm just, I have a bunch of women hanging around. But make no mistake, he wasn't always the zenith of peak male vitality, though. In fact, he actually dropped out of four separate high schools over the span of three years, even being arrested for bringing a machine gun on camera. <laughs> We're bringing a machine gun on campus his senior year. <laughs> so explain what led to you getting thrown in jail your senior year. Um, well, um, a machine gun and a shotgun in my vehicle on school grounds would be probably what led to that. <laughs> <laughs> and this was right after Columbine happened, which is kind of bad timing, if you will. Galaxy brain stuff here from our boy Dan. But after pulling event staples, he decided to abandon school altogether and enlist in the Navy right after graduating. I, I think he graduated. I'm not actually sure. All I know is that he is said to have spent about four years in the Navy, apparently going through 510 grueling days of SEAL training with two broken legs. You know, I done everything that I was supposed to do. I made it through hell week with broken legs. Like, no, you I did just, not. And I just, I went into medical and I asked him to look at my legs. I ran for like two miles and just destroyed them even more just because I was just so sick of the f***ing military. I just wanted to get out. And they gave me what I wanted. They were going to get me out. Uh, Think under the UCMJ, that's actually a crime. He's not running for two miles with broken legs if he's truly hurt. It just seems like this is made for social media. Dan's strained relationship with the US military becomes a little dicey, so stick with me here. The first step in becoming a Navy SEAL is completing basic underwater demolition training, known as BUDS for short. Meant to test physical and mental stamina, the 24-week program is described as demanding and intense. Most trainees don't even make it past this one phase, but Dan has insisted he spent over a year and a half on BUDS alone. Yeah, the same guy who struggles to land a jet ski in the water. <laughs> But he claims his extended training and frequent rollbacks had to do with his two stress fractures. I had broken legs for like a year and a half or a year and seven months. It was insane. It was basically like, they're like, okay, well this guy's legs are just never gonna fucking heal. So why wasn't it healing? I'm still confused. Well, because I went through SEAL training, that kind of fucked him just up fucked a little, him up for a little bit. Dan never officially became a SEAL, instead being kicked out just two days before passing to the next phase on account of a safety violation at the gun range, or in his words, no real good reason. Yeah, I'm sure there is no real good reason. I'm going to give you guys some perspective. For somebody to be rolled back from training two days prior to graduation, there has to be something pretty significant. Um, they they call Navy SEALs often the million dollar man, and that's because how much it costs to train these guys and how much time goes into that. So um, he doesn't dive into that, but I will say that does bring some red flags or questions. You have to have done something really bad or be very highly disliked, I would say. Rumors of Dan falling asleep during training and getting into arguments with officers have since circulated online. And although I have no real way to verify any of these testimonies, just the thought of Dan's former class making up songs to mock him after he got dropped is really beautiful to me. And this instructor that didn't like me, he just, he couldn't even find excuses the third time. He just admin dropped me. I didn't even know that was like a thing. I didn't even know you could get admin drop, but yeah. Hey, a broken leg and an honorable discharge still gave our man in the ledge $6,000 disability allowance, so. You know, I was getting the GI Bill and the uh, VA was paying me and I was getting grants and everything for, uh, for school. And so I was making pretty good money for a college student. Despite, yes, completing about 99% of the military's toughest training, his love-hate relationship with the Navy extends even further into his later years. When he paid his way into a military film, it in 2013, pumping one million dollars into production in exchange for eight minutes of screen time, they ended up cutting down to 60 seconds. Even trying to sue the production company afterwards? Yeah, actor. What's going on? Nothing, bro. I'm about to get out of here with my girl. <laughs> Whatever. Before any of that, Dan was officially discharged. In desperate need of a purpose and a place to go, he did what any affluent dickhead would do and became a business major. Using his disability money towards enrolling at the University of Florida, joining a frat, and of course, falling in love with the game of poker. <laughs>
Dan was only a freshman in college when he embarked on his first ever poker match, taking a liking to the game almost immediately. Staying up late and losing a ton of sleep was worth it if it meant getting to play an extra game with his classmates in between important business readings. By his sophomore year, Dan was addicted, even reportedly taking out a loan on his car and selling three of his most expensive guns so he had more money to gamble with. So I, like, I went like flat broke my sophomore year and I actually had to like sell three of my guns. Um, and then I took that money and went and like played on this gambling boat. Take a boat to the boat because it had to be in international waters. Being coached by his younger brother Adam, a real professional poker player, it wasn't until his 25th birthday when he actually set foot in a real brick and mortar casino, ready to prove his skills in the treacherous world of gamblers, sharks, and billionaires. Oh god, there's three of that size on the flop. Dan's doing a money way to did this Ford Explorer a year ago. Wait, let's get one thing straight. I'm an idiot, okay? I'm not gonna pretend I know the first thing when it comes to poker. I'm really not good at any game not called Mario Kart or Super Monkey Ball, for that matter. But I have read the comments under gambling videos of Dan, and I know his skills have been repeatedly brought into question by real experts of the game. And I think it's safe to say he isn't exactly the most well-respected in the community. Even Dan himself will tell you it was never his life goal to become the greatest poker star of all time or anything. He just wanted to be the rich asshole in the background, having his beard stroked by models. And that much is totally understandable. But it becomes a little more disingenuous when you start to attribute your enormously unfathomable wealth to your non-existent poker skills. I mean, even the most professional, well-known players in the world can barely scratch Dan's estimated net worth of 200 million. I moved to LA. And I started playing a lot of these poker games and I just, I don't know, kind of snowballed. Like I beat one guy for 54 million and- 54 million. Yeah. So, poker players make a lot of money, but not enough to justify the incredible spending habits of Danny Boy here. We're talking $50,000 for a bed frame, okay? He would need to be one of the absolute greatest to ever live, and we all know that just isn't fucking true. All in all, while Dan did play very aggressive, I wouldn't say that he played all that great. In fact, there was some serious button clicking going on in this match. I think that maybe he could beat some high stakes, very soft live games, but on the internet, he's a fish in the water. His lackluster abilities may have been enough to make him look cool in front of his audience of middle schoolers, but something about the way he presented himself in interviews and talked about his wealth just wasn't adding up. But his Instagram numbers definitely were. After breaking up with his playmate girlfriend in 2011, Dan vowed to live his life as a bachelor to the fullest extent from then on out, using the power of the internet to transform himself into a shining beacon of inspiration for sexless teenage boys in pastel shorts all over the nation. First joining the vanity-obsessed world of Instagram in 2012, the perfect platform for Dan to show off his exhilarating lifestyle of posing with his brother and chickens. Okay, his posts started off about as tame as you can get. A clear contrast to what they'd become over the following years. Somewhere along the way, Dan realized the more extreme his pics were, the more attention they would get. And began posting anything so long as he got those sweet, sweet likes and follows. He quickly built up a reputation of partying, drinking, having drug-laced orgies with supermodels, and having two heart attacks by the age of 32. I got no fucking idea. Doc's like, it's very important that you're thorough and that you tell us everything. We can't give you certain things if you know they mix with other drugs and I'm just like you know I was smoking some pot and my mom kind of like perks up you know I did, I did a little bit of cocaine and my dad's like looks over at me you know and I think I might have taken a little bit of Viagra and then my girlfriend's like you motherfucker and I'm just like ah maybe maybe and the doctor's like it's very important that you tell us how much I was like like, yeah, I think like 200 milligrams. The doctor was 200 milligrams. Yeah, I guess the cocaine and Viagra might, might have that effect. But at least he got to meet Michael Jackson's doctor, supposedly. Gracing headlines for some of his more outrageous stunts, including the time he was arrested for bomb making charges. Come on, Dan. What the f 
After blowing up his own tractor trailer, he pled no contest for failing to extinguish a fire out in the open. No jail time, no weapon restrictions, nothing. Just a measly fine of about 17 grand, which he only received because it happened on public property. Not to mention the time he launched porn star Janice Griffith off his rooftop. There are some details that I don't feel comfortable talking about right now. <laughs> Has uh, Dan called you up to apologize? He actually did not ever make an apology, unfortunately. Which is the only thing that I'm sort of, why? Mm. I did not ever hear sorry from him. Wow. Panicking at last minute, she grabbed Dan's t-shirt in a split second of regret before barely missing the pool below and smashing her ankle on the way down. Thanks to his scumbag legal defense team, he wasn't sued. Unlike the time he kicked a woman in the face at a nightclub in steel-toed boots, in which case he was sued. Vanessa Castano claims in a new lawsuit filed by her attorney, Keith Davidson, that Bilzerian was on the stage at the LIV nightclub and kicked her in the face with military boots. She says she began bleeding from the face and eye. Bilzerian's people say he kicked her because he was struggling to help another woman on stage, but Castano was blocking him. And I thought chivalry was dead. Turns out Dan just wanted to protect his girl while brutalizing another one. Can't think of anything more considerate. Almost reminds me of the time he tried to play hero during an active shooting. Holy fuck, this girl just got shot in the fucking head. It's so fucking crazy. Dan Bilzerian was one of 22,000 people in attendance the night a 64-year-old man opened fire at a Las Vegas music festival in October 2017. During the worst mass shooting event in American history, Dan could be seen running amongst the crowd, documenting his live experience to his online following. So I had to go grab a gun, I'm fucking headed back. It's fucking so crazy, some kind of... Mass shooting, fucking guy had a heavy caliber weapon for sure. Saw a girl fucking get shot in the face right next to her brain's fucking hanging out. Wanting to live up to the gun-toting macho man image he'd always exhibited, Dan was determined to do whatever he could to assist the situation. And I guess he figured the best way to do that was by begging to borrow a random cop's gun while people around him were literally dying. Being the guy who was once credited for saying his greatest fear is that someone will break into his house and he won't know what gun to shoot them with, he kind of became known for this menacing reputation. So the reactions from what viewers saw that night were mixed. Some expected him to do more than run for shelter, while others might argue he shouldn't have distracted officers from attempting to defuse an active shooting situation. But one thing I can tell you for certain is that this wouldn't be the only time his values were questioned, and it sure wouldn't be the last time Time he experienced controversy. According to all estimations, Ignite burned through over 100 million with about 2.5 million in gross profit in 2020. Yoda! It's insane. Where did the money go? Dan, what's up? DM me. Where's the money? At the end of the day, money's really freedom to me because when you got a lot of money, you can do whatever you want. Nobody can tell you what to do. But before we get into that, it's time for an ad. The wonderful and amazing saints over at Raycon. That's right, Ray J is disrupting the electronics industry by selling clean, nifty, premium, wireless audio for half the price of regular brands with no compromises. See, Raycon earbuds give you six hours of playtime, seamless Bluetooth pairing, and a more compact design for a comfortable and noise-isolating fit. From the way they design their products to the way they price them, Raycon prioritizes their customer experience with a 45-day money-back guarantee return policy. So if you're kinda on the fit, and just want to be sure these are all that's cracked up to be, might as well click the link in the description and try them out, right? <laughs> right? It <laughs> helps the channel. <laughs> Lately, I've been using mine while riding my bike and listening to Dan Bilzerian talk about all the women he slept with. <laughs> oh, what a guy. Go to buyraycon.com slash jobbery to get 15% off your order today. Massive thanks to Raycon for helping out once again. 
For the longest time, Dan insisted the bulk of his income was a direct result of his poker earnings, turning himself from a broke college kid to a self-made millionaire through his late 20s. But not everyone was convinced. For starters, Dan had only played in one public poker tournament, all the way back in 2009 when he came in 180th place and walked away with $36,000. The Bilzerian brothers have been enjoying their family reunion as well, both still in this thing. That's Adam adding to his chip stack. But at another table, his brother Dan is all in after the flop with ace high against the pocket tens of Jonathan Tamayo. Dan Bilzerian has to have an ace on the river. The river card is a king. Tamayo wins the pot and knocks off Dan Bilzerian. He became known for playing loose aggressive in the eyes of fellow poker sharks, even reportedly losing $2.3 million on a simple coin toss, according to GQ. Still, Dan claims to have made the majority of his money through non-traceable cash games with billionaires in private, which is extremely convenient, wouldn't you say? Especially considering his Instagram flexing began around the same time his father's trust funds finally became accessible. The trust funds, uh, I guess you were entitled to one when you turned 30, one when you turned 35. Um. Dan's father, Paul Bilzerian, made a name for himself back in the 80s, when corporate rating was at an all-time high. According to Investopedia, investors would target failing companies whose assets appeared to be undervalued, buy large enough shares to give them the controlling position at the company, and then use their power to artificially drive up the stock price either through internal management changes or by using their voting power to install hand-picked members to the board of directors. As long as the company's value went up, the investors would make an absolute killing. A practice that was questionable at best and straight up illegal at worst, depending on how you went about it, I guess. By 1989, though, the government had charged Paul with fraud and conspiracy, failing to disclose his ownership of various companies and selling his holdings right after their stock prices skyrocketed. Inside trading in its purest form. And if only Paul had been a little more discreet, he probably would have been able to get away with it. Well, he still kind of did, but not without being slapped with a $63 million fine and spending 13 months in federal prison for a ruling he called unjust. The whole time he had been telling me like, you know, oh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to jail because it was, you know, in the newspapers, the kids were asking me, so I'd ask him and he's like, oh no, definitely not. He was always like this crazy, like eternal optimist. Dan barely got to see his father growing up as it was, naming that lack of attention as one of the many driving forces behind his eccentric lifestyle. But Paul's arrest would prove itself traumatizing for Dan, constantly harassed by kids at school over his father being a Wall Street felon. So we're going to school and he's like, yeah, by the way, I'm going to jail. And um, I mean, I think he put it a little bit more eloquently than that. But anyways, it was, uh... how'd you take it? I sucked, man. I, you know, you got to go to school and all these kids are making fun of you and your dad's going to jail. It's like, I was kind of traumatizing moment. Through a complex network of offshore banks and family partnerships, however, the Bolzerian family managed to keep living in the 28,000 square foot palace for about 20 years. Plenty of time for Dan and his brother Adam to grow up in the mansion Paul dubbed his own Taj Mahal, even while the SEC scrambled to locate the tens of millions he owed the government, only paying back an estimated four of the 63 million before filing bankruptcy? Hey, come on, dude, you were not bankrupt. <laughs> In 1997, with the SEC still chasing Mr. Bilzerian's assets, ownership of the mansion is transferred to a Nevada partnership owned by an offshore trust that initially has, according to court records, Mr. Bilzerian and his wife as beneficiaries and trustees. His family continues living there even as Mr. Bilzerian, in a court filing, has said he has no assets. Going to extreme lengths to keep ownership of the house and his wealth, to the point where he'd rather go to prison than ever admit he was lying about his finances. To this day, that 50 plus million dollars has never been tracked down, but it all had to go somewhere, right? You know, I mean, you read the detractors or comments they've made that, uh, oh, nobody can make a hundred million dollars or whatever it is playing poker. He, uh, yeah. you know, he's just, you yeah, know, he's, poker's he's, kind of yeah, he he, sucks, the, the, the way he says he makes his money, but he's really gotten it from the, uh, you know, trust funds and you didn't, you didn't take it. I gave it all back, so. Really? Yeah. Uh, I gave it to my brother. Why? Uh, I just, I don't know, I didn't need it, didn't want it, didn't care. <coughs> 
Dan has never denied the existence of a trust fund under his or his brother's name, but he has given conflicting testimonies regarding the amount of money he's actually taken from them. So first he didn't accept any of it and instead handed everything over to his little brother because as we all know, Dan hates money that isn't his. But we'll get to that soon. Point is, he later went back on his word, admitting he did take a little bit from the trust. How much? I have no idea. As of now, there isn't definitive proof that Dan and his brother's trust fund were made up of entirely SEC money, but the evidence doesn't exactly say otherwise, does it? <laughs> At the end of the day, it'll probably always remain a mystery just how much Dan really inherited from his Wall Street criminal father. So it's been so long that I'm just used to, you know, I, I like, I never cared if people thought that I was good. I never gave a you know, if, you know, how people thought that I got my money. I still don't. I don't give a they think I, you know, got it all from a trust. I, I don't I mean, care. not at all. Like, I mean, somebody, if you've, like, earned it through, you know, your own intellect and hard work, it doesn't bother you at all that there's, like, some out there that, like, think that you, it was just handed to you? No, I, I don't really, you know, the thing is, like, there's so many people praising me. I just, I don't even, like, concern myself with the opinion. I mean, it sucks that I've lost all of my privacy pretty much, and I can't go anywhere without, you know, people coming up to me and, you know, wanting pictures and this and that. By 2017, he had partied with Steve Aoki, bought his way into a Matt Damon movie, and hooked up with 10,000 women. <laughs> what could possibly be in store next for the man who had done it all? Well, launching his own CBD business, of course. So what is the most exciting thing about the cannabis industry today? Why should people be excited about your product? Uh, I mean, because it's going to be one of the best products in the industry and it's going to be consistent across state lines. We're going to have global distribution. I imagine all the strains are just infused with Dan Blazerian's pubic hair and yeah. then like they just somehow like create an STD that he's had from like a model or some shit. Yeah. So maybe they just name it after the model and then the STD. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> In hopes of becoming the first premium global cannabis brand, Dan Bolzarian launched the company Ignite, selling everything from cannabis products to clothing, vapes, and beverages. This fucking guy was plastering his stupid goat logo on anything he could get his greasy fingers on. $39.99 for placebo gummies? Like, if this were the Lorax, I'm sure Dan would find a way to slap the Ignite logo on a bottle of air too. But by February 2019, Ignite was off to the races, with the brand finally going public on the Canadian stock market, debuting at a share price of about $2.51. All the meanwhile, the Ignite House YouTube channel, hosted by models Desi and Kayla, began pumping out lifestyle vlog type content that showcased even more details of Dan's highly luxurious daily routine. <laughs> <laughs> you want to run naked at the Elon's house? Yep. No. She's like, it's funny. No. <laughs> You're right. Fail. Everybody wanted to do it. Fail. All right, I'll give somebody. I'll give. I think girl. Dan should run naked. All right. I'll <laughs> if any of y'all do it, for, I'll give you fifty thousand. I'll do it. Okay. <laughs> somebody <laughs> get her a fucking bicycle. No. I mean, why? What? Okay. <laughs> I mean, what? <laughs> She's gonna knock on his door. If he answers the door, fifty thousand. If he answers the door. Yeah. What, what if he doesn't? No deal. Ten thousand just for going. <laughs> My Instagram is Redhead Ray, R A Y E. There you go, guys. You can stop asking she now. She loves pick pics. Slide in the DMs. Yeah, nothing weird or toxic to see here, folks. She's running away. No. She says, no, I can't okay, do it. I'm going to be right back. She's gonna be back, she's off camera, she's gonna contemplate things. There'll be many Uber drivers checking her out as they drive by there. Along with the new brand, Dan also boasted his massive purchase of a $63 million mansion on CNBC with the guy from Shark Tank, completely decked out with a 12-foot waterfall, infinity pool, tennis courts, and a parking lot fit for a fucking airplane. Not a bad start, especially considering Dan's rampant social media presence reaching an estimated half a billion people every month. The company should have no problem getting off the ground and selling CBD oil to the masses, right? <laughs> right? Well, maybe Dan should have stayed in business school. The mansions, the yachts, the parties, the models. How does Dan Bilzerian, the globe-trotting, cash-stacking, gun-toting, Instagram-boasting, partying playboy do it? According to a lawsuit filed this week, he doesn't. Dan Bilzerian rents his house and charges the rest of his six-figure lifestyle 
to a credit card that someone else pays off. See, in 2019, Ignite made money in two ways, and no, neither of those were actually selling products. Ignite issued and sold shares of its own company's stock, along with raising money via debt, according to Forbes, receiving about $25 million from proceeds of insurance sales, $19 million from convertible debt, and another $23.7 million from a short-term promissory note, which basically meant Ignite was holding on to a bunch of other people's money. And instead of actually using it to benefit the company or their constituents or whatever, it was all wasted by Dan himself. As a 2020 lawsuit would later reveal, Ignite was essentially being used as nothing more than Dan Bolzerian's own personal piggy bank. That's right, as Ignite's stock value plummeted, Dan continued to swipe the credit card. $15,000 for a ping pong table, $40,000 for a rock climbing wall, $128,000 for a two night stay in London, $130,000 for a photo shoot in the Bahamas, but only because he had to pay all those models. <laughs> These girls are on payroll. Wake up, buddy. Nobody fucking flies on a jet and goes to hang out with this dude. No, it's not how it works. I kind of like figured out that life is more about setup. You know, I wanted to, I wanted to like set it up so that I could get laid without like having a bunch of conversations and dates and whatnot, so. Using company money to cover enormous personal expenses would inevitably land Dan and his business in massive legal trouble thanks to a lawsuit filed by Ignite's former president, Curtis Heffernan. After refusing to approve of his boss's negligent spending, like, you know, an $800,000 yacht rental, Curtis was quickly axed from the company, to which he responded by suing Dan for wrongful termination immediately after. I mean, the guy was just trying to do his fucking job job is all, outlined in that very lawsuit began to reveal much of what many seem to already speculate regarding Dan's seemingly extravagant appearance. The famous Ignite parties hosted at Dan's mansion were some of the most exclusive and exotic events in the area. They were synonymous with Dan's image, but that's because it was all he seemed to care about vanity. He wanted to be seen as the guy, the rich asshole who could pull women effortlessly thanks to his iconic branding. But that's all it was, branding. Ignite as a company was hollow beyond any of the glitz and glamour seen on Instagram. As noted by Forbes contributor and local CBD expert Chris Roberts, I cover weed and CBD for a living. I live in an area absolutely saturated with CBD products, and I do not think I have ever seen an Ignite product out in the wild. Nobody was buying Ignite. As public records show, the company lost a grand total of $50 million its first year, with the stock value shrinking to about 68 cents at the time of me recording this. And as the lawsuit revealed, Dan didn't even own the Ignite house. Instead, he was only leasing it for about $200,000 a month and sticking somebody else with the tab. It's actually really funny that CNBC had to go back and change the title of their tour once the truth came out. He reportedly paid a mind boggling $65 million for this mega mansion. Dan says he made 50 million bucks playing high stakes poker. I mean, I have to talk to my accountant about all of it. I don't know. Of course, Dan denies everything, the whistleblowers have alleged, and plans on countersuing his former president, but that hasn't stopped anonymous employees from coming out of the woodwork and confirming Heffernan's very claims. Ignite pays for everything, one said. Models, events, yachts, Dan would just have it wrapped with the Ignite logo, and all of a sudden, it was an Ignite expense, and he would send them the bill. Yeah, I mean, one look at his Instagram, and that seems to check out. Some claims even seem to show show his dad was running the show behind the scenes, which is illegal since he can't touch another American company after being convicted of fraud. Oh, that's why it's listed on the Canadian market. He is, I think he's a St. Kitts citizen and I think he gave up his US citizenship. You don't um, talk to him? I talk to him um, probably four or five times a year. <laughs> You really don't get rewarded for your honesty. In many ways, Dan Bolzerian can be seen as the real-life Tony Stark. That is, if Tony Stark was surrounded by a rotating cast of nameless models he paid for, lied about where his money came from, distracted an officer during an act of shooting, and drove Stark Enterprises into the ground. To Dan's credit, it's hard to feel any sense of real accomplishment when everything in life has been handed to you. Growing up surrounded by such tremendous wealth must have a real impact on a person's psyche, and I can only imagine how insignificant Dan must have 
Bielefeld, having always lived in his father's shadow, constantly in search of a fragment of individuality he could claim as his own. After priding himself on being authentic and upfront about the way he lives his life, it's painfully ironic to see how everything is panned out as a result of peeling back the curtain. But it does go on to perfectly emphasize what can happen when a silver spoon chud takes over as CEO of a company while possessing no business experience or a significant level of maturity whatsoever. Dan Bilzerian will lie about anything so long as it makes his image more appealing, whether it's photoshopping celebrities on Instagram or using other people's money towards his own personal ventures. The very foundation of his credibility is built on deception. He didn't do it on his own, he just got lucky. And if you ask me, Dan is only another spoiled trust fund recipient, posing as a beneficiary to the fictional American dream. A reminder to all of us that his self-made playboy lifestyle is far from the idealistic utopia he wants us to think it is, and that a pristine social media presence can conceal even the dirtiest of secrets. But at the end of the day, I think we can all agree on the worst thing Dan has done. And my first video on Dan was from 2015, and it was my first video to clock in half a million views. So to be completely honest with you guys, well, I gotta give Dan Bolzerian a huge thank you for helping me launch this channel. Keep on going.